for coming and thank you for accepting my my abstract, my paper. So, um, yeah, uh, having listened to the presentations this morning, there's, there's lots and lots of overlaps, I hope, uh, or whether it's me just kind of retroactively trying to fit my, my paper around, around what people are saying. Um, so, uh, what I want to talk about is um, a, a way of mapping some thoughts that I have about photography and thoughts I have about uh, teaching, I guess, underpin this, like how am I teaching photography these days. Um, and my conclusion, I think, uh, will, will, will appeal to a certain failure of photography and uh, a failure of intersubjectivity, a failure of communication. And, and I, what I hope to do is to take that as a way of, of re-engaging with, with photography itself. So that's to suggest, um, essentially, that photography can be read as the interface of a changing late capitalist subjectivity. So it may be useful to register and to be clear about the conceptual place from which I speak. Um, I'd approach photography from both a sense of weariness and a sense of excitement. Excitement because photography is doing so many interesting things, and I think we've seen some examples of that in the, in the previous uh, talks. Uh, but also a weariness at how the subject is often approached using theoretical instruments that seem to have not been revisited for quite some time. So a consequence of this railing against photography as it once was, compared with photography as it is now, means my critical reflection begins with an articulation of a negation or misunderstanding of photography. And I claim that this misunderstanding is, in fact, the photography's constitutive form. So I say this, this may sound counterintuitive. However, I remain convinced this approach opens uh, a useful gap for us to intervene in reconfiguring the wider project of what photography is and does. So an example of, uh, of this process um, and how it functions can be seen in the scene from Four Weddings and a Funeral, where Hugh Grant fails to communicate his feelings for Andy McDowell. Uh, what is being expressed in this scene is more potent when Grant articulates through a structure of misunderstanding. So what then is the misunderstanding of photography? What's, what's its very negation? So, the digital, in the digital age, uh, photography constitutes a new condition. And part of this condition incorporates thinking about how algorithms, and we've talked about that uh, this morning, data and processual information creates an image in new form. This approach uh, shifts the emphasis, I believe, from visual analysis towards something that is processual, that is system-based, and something that speaks to non-human agency, or to, and I quote, the, strangers, the strange strangers of non-human actors. Of course, inevitably, there's a problem with attempting to claim photography is a subject that is not anything but visual. But I believe the structure, this structure of negation sits at removing the visual from our understanding of photography. So to express the same thing in a different way, my starting point is not the visual content of photographs, but the very form of photography. In other words, we, pay, we should pay attention not to what something is, but to the way it is done. I do this because I believe it's then possible to develop a more complex point about the digital subject, and in relevance to this conference here, about the new human digital subject. So my general argument, or rather its coordinates on which it's built, is that the digital age and a new subject is formed that embodies three foundational elements. These are proximity, sharing and choice. However, I claim that they, they are fundamentally paradoxical forms, since I describe them as being a proximity that is replaced by the interface of the screen a sharing that fervently excludes those unable or unwilling to participate, and an excess of choice, but an inability to choose. So it's of course no coincidence that these qualities are not only that of the digital subject, but I believe also of photography. And if I can just talk about photography in those terms. Um, today, photography appears <coughs> to um, offer a way to close down distances, and while we can communicate instantly, sending images of where we are and what we are doing from right here, right now, to right there, right now, 
Inevitably, the physical distance that separates us is replaced by the screen interface, a consequence of which is that all contact, near and far, appears to be mediated and replaced by the very same screen. In terms of sharing, and in the context of digital environments such as Facebook, Snapchat and Instagram, sharing photographs is a commonplace activity. However, sharing is not necessarily inclusive. Rather, it forcefully excludes those who are not followers or friends, and it favours those who interact by liking, swiping right, commenting, retweeting, or sharing. So, the final, the final uh, paradox is uh, a choice. So, ch with many photographs available online, it's not unreasonable to question why we might need to take any photographs at all. Should we decide to make our own images, the seemingly excess of choice becomes a constraining force, advocating that we take only certain familiar and standard types of images that conform to certain choices of images that we've already seen before. The unending possibilities of these images seem to have exposed its opposite, namely a limited set of standard and familiar image formulas and types. So digital photographic determination, I argue, rests on the triadic logic of these seemingly contradictory positions. So it's my view that these elements, um, uh, in these elements, a digital photograph appears to be elaborated in a way that enacts a moment of absolute recall, wherein the, its determination is mediated and structured by itself. So photography is not mediated by its opposite, as we might understand identity through difference, or essence through appearance. In this sense, photography can be defined as such not because it is neither painting nor movies, but instead photography is its own epistemic obstacle. So I suggest there is a way of processing the look of, uh, and looking at how, at how we think about photography as, as an al amalgam of, of theories. And I'd like to just explore two frameworks of theories uh, that, that I think can be usefully applied to photography. So, uh, Levi Bryant um, came up with two, two positions of culture, which he says one has a focus on lived experience, and this is the uh, ph phenomenological field, what we experience uh, are things onto which we project intentions, meanings, signs, and discourse. And this approach, of course, is one largely familiar to those who studied photographic theory in the 80s and probably continue to, to, to deliver that, that kind of thinking. While the other culture that, that Brian uh, establishes is one that pays attention to the differences contributed by non-human agencies. This, of course, is the domain of new materialists or the vital materialists or the thinking of object-orientated ontologies. So in the democracy of objects, Brian <coughs> borrows from uh, uh, and builds upon Delander's term of a flat ontology in which there are no ontological privilege agents that can totalise reality. And it's this flat ontology that he, he uses to reconcile these two differentiated positions. So I won't go into it in too much detail, but he, Brian essentially outlines uh, four terms for this. So the first is that no objects have a full presence or actuality. Second, that the world doesn't exist, really uh, uh, an interesting one for us sitting here today. What he means by that is that there's no super object, there's no container of the world in which we, we uh, gather everything together. Um, thirdly, that humans occupy no privileged place within being, so we're left with differences by degree rather than by kind. And finally, that all objects have an ontological equal footing. So in this regard, we can think of technologies and fictions as being just as real as planets, trees, and oceans. So in that way, we, we can think of differing terms of the temporal and spatial experiences and consider the entanglement of collective forms. And we're veering dangerously into our Deleuzian assemblages um, at this point. I, I believe that photography helps structure a particular flatness of subjectivity. And this flat ontology, I think, also opens up the same, same idea. Um, Along similar lines, Jacques Rancière argued that a man with a movie camera, and I took some random stills from, from the film here, if, uh, for those not familiar with it, uh, Rancière suggested it's an example of cinematic communism. 
it presents a multiplicity of forms in everyday life. And so in the film we see activities such as washing hair, speaking on the phone, uh, unplugging cables. And Rancière um, make, says that what makes this cinematic practice communist is that all these displays activities are equalised and entangled. He claims they present an assertion of radical universality, such that the usual hierarchies and oppositions are suspended, and as such there is an apparent harmony of being. I believe it's also possible to extend Rancière's position on this to the point where image as a structuring force creates apparent universality. So in this way, the everyday activities presented uh, in Man with a Movie Camera are the forerunners of the YouTube videos of people doing things such as unboxing or chores like cleaning a car. If we move from the particularity of the visual um, to, to the universi universality of form, then I think we, we start to encounter uh, where photography breaks down. And, and I think it's here at, that it fails at its, its form of intersubjective communication. And so I suggest that photography at this point represents the symbolic dematerialized labor and one that is common to late capitalism. So situated and circulated, and most obviously within the horizontal social networks of the internet, and emerging through the advances in associated technology, photography embodies something of how Marx described the general intellect. That is to say that Marx articulates how the material mechanism of industrial production expresses the relationship of capitalist domination, when the worker is a mere supplement to the machinery owned by the capitalist. The same can also be said of the digital subject who inhabits the internet, such that a particularity of social positions are seemingly eradicated. And similarly, the power relations are ob obfuscated by the notion of there being some form of collective, neutral, self-regulated and self-organising system. So the ceaseless rendering of experience as photographic image has served to transi the transition from industrial age to information age. And in doing so, the reconfiguring of <coughs> modernist need mode of production into the phrases of network and interlinked expressions. At this point, I would claim that the concept of a proletarian subject and the exploitation of such a subject requires some rethinking. And clearly, we can see that the notions of surplus value, wherein labour is measured by time and profit emerges from that, does no longer fit a capitalist model. And even Marx himself was aware that knowledge becomes central to wealth production when the, class the uh, classical logic of exploitation no, no longer works. So big technology companies such as Google, Facebook, Microsoft and Apple control the sy symbolic substance of society, our very means of failing to communicate. And so today, in order for us to attempt to communicate with one another, we have to pay rent in some form to these organisations. It's therefore a different model of making money, and this is very different from appropriating extra profit. So in the economy of everyday photographic images, it seems that we can consider exchange as being the formal determinant of a distracting means of reproduction. Instead of mustering resistance to the inequalities of permeating the social order, we re resist confrontation by imaging and imagining the world. In a time of crisis with regard to critical, new and workable ideas, along with the social shifts that le lead away from confronting economic, environmental and political consequences, the obsession with and production of an excess of images expresses a fundamental failure of our vision and signifies a bright blind spot in awareness. A further point for consideration, I think, is how photography is a process that is becoming more and more technically sophisticated, and yet our experience is not a seamless rendering of the world, in which image and reality become indistinguishable. Rather, what becomes apparent is the gap between the symbolic surface and reality. So photographs don't appear to render the, more pre render the world more precisely and accurately, despite uh, the claims for, for greater resolution with the latest cameras. This is to suggest that faithful experience depends as much on what is implied as what is stated. 
Thus, the excessive qualities of image are of the same order as the information overload that pr provokes a kind of paralysis of choice. So the relative narrowness of the mediated image form, such as Instagram, Facebooks, and Snapchat, etc., are able to penetrate our interior worlds that are in ways that reality itself fails. When confronted by experience that is other than image, we immediately become positioned at an ordinary, normal distance. But the movement here is from ethereal presence of the image to a brutal immediacy. Furthermore, the trauma we experience when moving from mediated image to reality is not caused by some form of desublimation, but experience is not a void that gets filled by the real. Instead, the digital environment is over-present and part of a continuous and friction-free free flow of image after image. And ultimately, what this removes is a sense of the power relations and social antagonisms that are part of the economy of exchange. So if I can draw a certain set of conclusions here, I believe that photography can be used as a way to articulate the distancing of proximity. It can express the exclusive nature of sharing, and it can embody the paralysis of too much choice. But in all these ways, I think visually, photography fundamentally fails to deliver, and that's probably why we continue to go on shooting. So, I, in my final concluding slide, I move back to the, um, the room of the analyst and patient and suggest that um, the impossibility of inter intersubjectivity is part of what photography enables, uh, it embodies. In this picture, I think you can see that we're not in dialogue with one another. We're together in a failing attempt to understand one another. And I imagine in this room, we too are failing to communicate in such a way. But there is one solidarity that we all have, which is that we're all looking out there towards something. And if I may conclude by borrowing from Stephen Frosch's uh, talk at the recent London Critical Theory Summer School, where he talked of Alfonso uh, Lingus, the community of those with nothing in common. And he said that the essential quality of being in communication <coughs> with someone who's dying makes um, enacts a situation wherein nothing you can say can really make any difference. But the prospect of some form of communication is often built at that point of its greatest failure. Thank you.